I've been getting a lot of questions about the Lean To Climbing Wall Systems Board build plans that I have available on climberdad.com. So I thought I'd make this video to go over some of the five things that I think that you need to know before you start building your own Lean To Climbing Wall Systems Board. Thank you for joining me on the Climber Dad journey here. This video is going to be a talking video about the things that you need to know about the Lean To Climbing Wall Systems Board, regardless of whether it's my design or not. There are other videos that I have that's going to be more about my life. If that's what you're here for, well, this video, it's not going to be for you. Five things, why, where, what is your design? What are the materials? And of course, safety. Uh, there's many reasons why you might want to build it. Maybe your drive time to your local gym is way too far for you to get there as many times as you would like to train for climbing. Maybe you're just getting into climbing and you're trying to learn how to do that and using that as a good, full body, fun, workout. That's a good reason right there. Maybe you want it for your kids so they can learn that body movement, hand-eye coordination at a whole new level and at a nice pace, their own pace. Do it as fast or slow as they want. So there's some reasons of why you might want to build a climbing wall. Now specifically the lean-to climbing wall self-supporting. It doesn't attach to any other structure. It can be wherever it needs to be. If you're living in an apartment and you cannot attach it to anything, uh, if you think that you're going to be moving soon and you want to take this investment because building a climbing wall, especially right now, is a pretty big investment as those materials are getting more and more and more expensive. Maybe you're in a situation like I am right now where I can build an outdoor climbing wall, which isn't very good in the area that I live in, and I want to be able to move that into an enclosed space when that's available. There's many reasons why. Now let's talk about where. And actually, before I talk about where, there's something that I need to do. I need to go outside and do something. Come on. So just moved into this house. Uh, we're out in the country because that's... <laughs> Well, at first I love the country, and this is what we could afford, and I've just been moving stuff in and like putting plastic over it as, as we get it. This is my only garage, right there. Uh, I built that out of uh, pallets and some discarded plastic. All that I have left from Clarksville Climbing Gym is right here under this trailer. Now, let me show you something about this. You see this? That is moisture built up from the inside. We've got such moisture issues here that I have to unwrap this to let it on these nice bright days to let the moisture bake off. When you have constant days of like 90% humidity, 95% humidity, it just, the moisture gets everywhere, but I'm still, I'm just so surprised at how much moisture and how much water has built up underneath that tarp. So we got some climbing holds, some volumes. Oh, I built this volume on the channel. That was when I caught, when I, my name was Thrifty Climber Guy. Climber Dad's much better. Look at, look at all this moisture. This, this piece of nice birch just soaked. All right, we'll let this stuff dry off now and we'll get in there and get back to the video. So clearly you can see that I am gonna be battling a lot of moisture issues in the area that I live in. This area is not gonna be that great for an outdoor climbing wall. Now, if I lived in a more mild climate where I'm not battling moisture and it's fairly good even temperatures uh, year round or even for a larger part of the year, 
then an outdoor wall could work great. Now, if you are building an outdoor wall, you're gonna to have to think about how to protect that. Here, I'm gonna to have to build a shell over the back of that wall to protect it from the elements and try to keep that moisture off as it off of it as much as possible. Also, when you're building it outside, you wanna be able to bring that wood, the lumber, off of the ground a little bit to help it prolong. Even treated lumber sitting on the ground will not last as long as if it was brought up off of the ground. It's also a good idea if you're on concrete, bare concrete, to have that bottom board treated lumber as well. When you come home and it's your training day and you want to get out there and climb, are those hurdles of the weather and moving whatever it is out of the way that's protecting your wall, is that going to keep you from going out there and climbing? It's a good thing to ask and talk about. Now it's time to get into design of the climbing wall. I'm talking about design. Check out this shirt. This came in yesterday. I was very excited to receive it. Let's check it out. Oh yeah. And then on the back, we have the tag, climberdad.com, and the logo. I designed it recently. This is a remake of another shirt that I had, uh, but the colors are a little bit different in this design. I'm also printing it with a different printer, so it works. It's a little bit better. The last one, unfortunately, was it did not last very long. And I'm hoping that this one is much better. I'm using a company called Printful. I'll leave a link down in the description below just in case you, you think that uh, you want to design some shirts for yourself and start a business that way. Let's talk about the design of this climbing wall. And I'm going to talk not sp so specific about the lean to climbing wall that I have over at climberdad.com, but in general, a design criteria for just regular climbing wall systems boards that you're going to want. And I'll cover different aspects because Mine is a little bit different than the regular one that you're going to see out there. This is a side, side view. Oh, I don't know if you can see that. I'll try to draw it a little bit bigger so it takes in a little bit more space. We got the board here. This is your main frame and this is your kicker. Okay, now regardless of what climbing wall you have or where you're building it, whether it's self-supporting or not self-supporting, you're going to most likely have these two elements. Your kicker is at the bottom of the climbing wall, and it's called a kicker because you're going to be kicking against it with your feet. It's only, it's so low that it's just going to be feet or touching it. Now, you could do some crazy weird moves, I guess, where you're, I don't know. It's for your feet mainly. And then you have your main frame, the, the main part of the climbing wall at least, at minimum, it needs to be eight feet tall. Okay, your kicker, I would say, needs to be a minimum of one foot tall, 12 inches. Now, you could probably shorten that up a little bit. You definitely, I wouldn't, it would just be worthless, in my opinion, if you were going less than uh, eight inches on this. You might as well just incorporate that kicker into the main part of the climbing wall and going down. Let's talk about something that's going to, some differences between my wall and, uh, let's say, uh, moon board. Now you can take the Climber Dad Lean To Climbing Wall and make a moon board out of it. There's a couple of things that you're going to need to change though. And that is the T-nut spacing and then two uh, studs in the back of the wall. You're going to have to slide those over a little bit as well. I use the standard American English measurement, the SAE, and that's because all of the material that I get is based on that. So a sheet of plywood is 96 inches tall by 48 inches wide. And if I have a T-nut spacing of six inches, then it works out perfectly. On the edge, I will go three inches from the edge and then I will go six inches all the way down. Now what happens and why this works out so good is because when I come up here with my other board, 
this is three inches from that edge, which in total between those two is six inches. And I have consistency everywhere I'm going with that T-nut spacing. It just works really well. Now the first generalized systems board that was made standard around the world is the moon board. And that was designed over in England. They use metric. So there it was metric. And I would say if I were, and it's based, the moon board is, I believe, 20 centimeters on center for your Tina spacing. I would do 10 centimeters on center for your T-nut spacing. That's going to be a little bit tighter than six inches. I never use metric. By doing 10 centimeters, that's going to allow you to also do your tension board, your kilter board, and the moon board with lights. So do the 10 centimeter T-nut spacing. You're going to start from the left side of your wall and go out from there. There's two studs that you're going to have to move. So go ahead and lay out your T-nut pattern and then adjust your frame by moving over those studs so you don't, you're not blocking those T-nuts with a stud. So there's some of the differences between the Climber Dad Lean 2 Systems Board Climbing Wall. I just am keeping the six inch T-nut spacing. I got kids running down the hallway. Let's talk about the basic design of this lean-to climbing wall and some of the things that I've seen out there. So some of the frames that I've seen out there, this is a pretty standard one. In fact, I think Climbing Daily built a, built a frame like this where it was fairly rigid, which is a good because of the design style that it is. But you had your kicker, you had your main frame, and then you have the legs that come down vertical like this, just dead vertical, and then you have a base that comes over here. Now, I see this design all over the place. It's an all right design. Uh, it works, but with this design, this you can have this energy right here and right here. Now, you, with this energy right here, as you pull out here, this leg is going to want to rock back. So it's going to want to rock back. You're going to have to have something that's super rigid right through here. This joint, this joint, and this joint. They all need to be super rigid. Now, what is the strongest shape? Now, and this goes back to kindergarten days here. You don't have to think too hard about it. You might be overthinking it. your triangle. So I built my wall off of this triangle. So I have my main frame. Right here. Okay. I have my leg. Right here. And then this is where it gets a little bit off is the kicker. So the kicker comes down here. Now in the Climber Dad design, there's a brace that goes right here. Super, super important that that brace is there so it makes this still a rigid line. So you gotta make sure that that is rigid. So you have one joint in here instead of three or four different joints that you need to make sure is very rigid. Now in the past, I've gotten some criticism uh, by using a ratchet strap here. So in this system, I use a ratchet strap that goes from here to here to keep that leg in to help support that leg. And there's a, a reason that I can use a ratchet strap here versus the other way. Now the other design where this leg is straight up and down, you absolutely cannot use a ratchet strap because that leg needs to be stable coming back in both pull and drag, okay? It's gotta be both pull and drag. Now this one, 
It just has to be stable in a drag because the weight of the climbing wall just by itself is going to be pulling that away constantly. So in this design, from this point to this point, is going to be under constant tension. Nothing will change the fact that this is going to be under tension, uh, pulling away from each other, not getting pushed towards each other. Because it's under constant tension, it's not going to be bouncing. It's never going to be loaded and then unloaded, loaded and then unloaded. It's, it's always going to have that constant tension. Some of you are saying, oh, you can't use a ratchet strap and trust your life in that. That's not what it's designed for. I'm not trying to argue to say, yes, you should use a ratchet strap. If you don't want to use the ratchet strap, then don't. But also think about it. Have you ever trusted your life to a ratchet strap? Have you ever driven past someone or by someone that's maybe on the freeway that has a load on a trailer or a pickup truck that is strapped down with ratchet straps? Is that not trusting your life to a ratchet strap? I know that some of the loads that I have pulled down the road that I've secured with ratchet straps, if that came undone, people would have died. And it's something that, yes, they were rated for the load, and that is something that you need to think about here. I will not use a ratchet strap that does not have a minimum of 1,500 pound load capacity. I like to find the straps that are a one and a half or a two inch wide strap here. And I also want to make sure that I'm going around the barrel of the ratchet a couple of times so it's really secure and it's not going to slip. Uh, you also want to inspect this strap for sun damage. If it's going to be outside, you've got to inspect that. Make sure that it's not getting uh, sun rot uh, or weathered or chewed on by animals. Keep that in mind. But I think that it is perfectly safe to use a ratchet strap there. Comment down below whether you think I'm wrong or right. I would love to see those uh, and your opinion on it. So we've talked about the legs that are going to support this self-sustaining wall, vertical versus uh, kicked out. Uh, I think that it is much better to be kicked out. Now, some people are worried about uh, coming down and hitting these legs uh, because it is so kicked out. If you're worried about hitting these legs, you need to be worried about hitting the legs that are vertical as well because it doesn't change. Uh, if you're gonna if you're gonna hit this leg, well, you would hit it if it was vertical as well. I have never hit the leg. I haven't. Uh, maybe somebody else has. Let me know if you have, but I haven't seen it. Um, this pivot point needs to be nice and secure. I would use either a grade eight, three eighths bolt minimum. You could go with a half inch bolt. That would be even better. There's a little bit more surface area on that. So um, yeah, those are your two options. Uh, I am not an engineer. I am just a guy that loves building climbing walls and I'm sharing my experience with you guys. Now let's talk about the main frame. So the frame of the climbing wall. We're going to have your header, which in this application, a single two by six, it's going to work just fine. You're going to have your base plate. Single two by six. Or if you're using two by eights or two by tens, whatever, that'll work just fine as well. Just single. Then you have your studs. Oop. Try to make that a little bit more square. Okay, so your outside studs, those those are really important as well. Also, this center stud. Is important very important also all right and what I'm gonna base this off of we're gonna talk about it, if it's eight by eight that's the minimum the minimum that you're gonna to want to build this eight feet by eight feet now it's not really gonna change anything if you wanted to go 10 feet or 12 feet 
it's all going to apply the same. So eight feet wide, that's going to help you go stable. I have built this exact same style, uh, four feet wide. And I tell you, if you only have the space to go with a four foot wide frame, save yourself some time, just build a campus board. Seriously. Don't, don't go with climbing wall, do a campus board. You're going to get more training. It's going to be better for that space. If you cannot go eight feet. And okay, so eight by eight is the minimum that you need to really get the movement, the body movement that you need to really enjoy climbing. It's a good, it's a good size board. You can, you can get, get that T a 10 foot board is much better than an eight foot board. Um, and you know, a 12 foot board is obviously better, but if you can get a lot out of an eight by eight, having that extra two feet on there is really nice. When I, when I build this, I will run the studs 24 inch on center. So that means that I have a stud coming down here as well. Now, when you are building a more standard uh, systems board, like a moon board or a kilted board or a tension board, this stud and this stud need to slide one way or the other. Do your T-nut layout and then adjust those studs accordingly. But those two studs need to move. Uh, I have recently had the thought, what would happen if you didn't put those studs in? I mean, you'd save a lot of money, you'd save a lot of weight. Would it work? I'm not really sure. You would obviously have a lot more flex, but we are using a pretty rigid plywood. So the panels that you use over this is going to make a big difference on that. I would also increase the amount of screws that I put in this while I'm attaching those panels. Normally I do six inch screw spacing around the perimeter and then everything interior I do 12 inch um spacing on those screws but if i did it like this i would do six inch t-nut spacing through here as well uh, on both sides of the seam because you're going to run the plywood right through here uh, and i also might run a horizontal as well so it gives you just a little bit more to attach to and a little bit less bounce because from this corner to this corner is quite a pretty that's a pretty big distance but you put that in there it shortens that up that would save you uh one two by i'm gonna give that a try and see if that works i think it'll work just fine i know that the 24 inch on center works great the original climber dad lean to wall was built and designed out of the necessity to fill a space fast and on a very very tight budget and I just happen to have a box full of discarded door hinges these were heavy-duty door hinges and I thought that's gonna save me some time so I built my kicker panel which was 16 inches and that's because it slices nice on the material that I have so it's 16 inches tall I would not go smaller than a 12 inch kicker you're really just losing the point of a kicker when you go smaller than 12 inches. So 16 inches works really nice for a kicker. It's actually slightly big, but. And then I went with my main frame here. Now with those door hinges and where they came into play is it was going to save me time instead of figuring out exactly what I wanted to have that angle set at and really planning it out, I was gonna make it slightly adjustable. And I didn't have to cut in these miters, I didn't have to figure out how I was gonna bolt that together because I did want this to be somewhat mobile so I can move it around. We took it to some events to help promote the climbing gym. Um, so the hinges were just a perfect place to do it and I had them. So we put our hinges in here and it worked out wonderful. Now this joint needed to be solid. So I have my bracket that I've already talked about. 
that crosses over this joint. And we actually, we want it to be more forward. Let's erase that, redraw it here. We want it to be in front of that hinge as it comes across. So it makes it more stable, okay? That's gonna lock it down. And how I adjusted it, if it was just a small adjustment, I would not move that bracket at all. I would just let the, the legs out or pull the legs in and either rock this uh, base up on the front edge or put it on the back edge a little bit. It worked just fine. Now, if I was gonna make a huge adjustment to it, then I could remove this bolt right here and slide this board up on the frame and then bolt it back down in another position. And that would change this angle. It worked out quite nicely, but I do think that there is a better way. And this is the better way. We talked about these hinges. Oh, I forgot. Before I get into that, I need to talk more about those hinges. You guys need to know about that. This is probably the biggest question that I get about this wall is what kind of hinges? So these hinges, you want to get a heavy duty door hinge. Okay, a heavy duty door hinge, either a three or four inch door hinge. Actually, I, I, I think a three inch hinge would be too small. Look at the pin on the hinges. If the, if the pin is smaller, than a quarter inch pin, I wouldn't use it. If it's a quarter inch pin or bigger, you're totally fine. Uh, well, usually you're totally fine. Of course, you wanna look at the whole material of it. Is, is Are these hinges gonna roll out? So if it's a really thin metal, um, avoid those hinges. And then uh, if it's greater than a quarter inch pin, you're good to go. Now, I might, if you guys want, let me know, uh, get some hinges and weld them on the back side so, we don't ev so you don't ever have to worry about them rolling out uh, and then sell them on climberdad.com. That's something that I can do for you if that would really help you out. Uh, of course, I would have to charge for my time and it wouldn't be a very cost-effective way to do it. The most cost-effective way to do it would be to ju just go find a really heavy-duty hinge and make sure that it's got a nice thick metal on it, which if I'm going to be welding these up for you guys, I would have that hinge anyways, and then I would just put the extra security of a weld back there. So it would make sure that it is nice and solid for you. Hinges in the original design of this, if I have this brace on there, they actually don't need to hold all of the weight of the climbing wall. They just need to hold a little bit of the climbing wall. Uh, because most of that energy, most of the weight is going through those braces that are on the side. But if you want to change it up so this is much more adjustable, then you do want to have a pretty heavy duty hinge. One of those ways that you can adjust, adjust this and change it, and if I build this wall again, this is how, well, one of the ways that I would change it. I actually, uh, if you've seen my video, if you have not seen my video of the best home climbing wall build, you got to go check that out. That, that is totally the best way to do it. Uh, it was fantastic. I love that wall. I wish that I was not in an Airbnb when I built that because it was amazing. I would still have that wall today if, if I could have gotten it home, but I was 2,000 miles away from home. So uh, another way that you could do it much cheaper than that as well is you build a good solid base down here so that your kicker was sitting by itself. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and come out here like that, maybe two feet out in front, maybe two feet in back. I would use a two by six here. It'd be uh, much, much more secure using a two by six. You might be able to get away with a two by four, but I would brace it in the back. This brace could easily be a two by four, no problem. And then if I was using a 2x4, I would absolutely brace it up here as well. Okay. Now that's going to be stable, fairly stable, just by itself for that 16-inch kicker. And then you have your leg. It's pivoting right here and coming down to the wall, to the ground. Now, if I ran the strap from this base of the leg over here, 
I would be in trouble because this could potentially, now it would have to rock up this way, which would be pretty hard, but it could potentially, or fold down that way, which would kind of be hard, but it could do it. And so you, ha you have a problem there because your triangle now has a break in one of the legs. But if we take that strap, and you can still do a ratchet strap. I'd still do a ratchet strap here, just a, a good one. And you take that ratchet strap from here, and you come up to here. Then you have this nice triangulated point that's just gonna be solid. Now the only thing that this is gonna do, the only direction of pull, that, or direction of movement, is gonna be down. So having this base right here like this is just going to make it more secure and just in case this slides somewhere, you, this isn't going to fall. This I think would be a great way to change that original de design build that's for sale over there at climberdad.com. So there you go, free, uh, free little addition to that build. Now let's let's go over some of the things that I know that I missed. Uh, you're gonna need to use construction grade screws. There is a difference. If you're using drywall screws, you are endangering yourself because uh, well, they break really easy. Now that we've covered all those things, let's talk a little bit more about the materials. And there is a complete list of materials on my build documents that you would need to do this as well as a cut list, which is really beneficial when you're doing a project like this. Uh, right now, those plans are, they're not very much. It's only a couple of bucks over at climberdad.com. Now I am gonna try to revamp that website so it works a little bit better. Uh, I have had people say that the link does not redirect you all the time. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. I have not been able to find out why, uh, but I have been emailing you or emailing everyone that buys that with the link just in case please be patient I, I will email you I promise uh, and if for some reason I haven't email me the at gmail.com so let's cover these because you do need to know this and maybe you don't want to buy those plans that's okay I'm gonna help you out still the materials that you're gonna need typical materials for a climbing wall build you're gonna use three quarter inch plywood for the frame I would say a minimum of a two by six is what you need. It just gives the rigidity. Can you use a two by four? I guess, but you really want to see what species it is and make sure that it's a strong two by four. Two by eights are, they have even that much more strength, but they are getting pretty expensive. Back when I made this list, I suggested using two by eights. Two by eights were actually cheaper for me to buy at that time than a two by six and they do have more strength, so that's why I was using 2x8s. By, two by hey, the T-nuts. If you are in the United States, the T-nut that you're going to use is a 3 8 16 thread T-nut. We get the four prong, or even better than that, you want to get a three screw T-nut. Now, Escape Climbing sells some fantastic T-nuts. I love these using these T-nuts. They have two screws, instead of three two is just fine and they're just a little bit bigger a little bit better than your regular standard t-nut i've already talked about the ratchet strap you want to have something that's at least a minimum of 1500 pound uh, load capacity on the ratchet strap and if you're worried about that get something that's even beefier last but not least is safety for both building your climbing wall and operating your climbing wall. So I'm not gonna get too much into the safety of the tools because there's a lot of people out there that all they do is talk about the safety of the tools and they go over it really well. We also wanna talk about the safety of operation. So some of the things that you're gonna want to do to make sure that you're safe with this operation if it is the lean-to climbing wall that I sell on climberdad.com, 
then you're going to want to check all of your attachment points and make sure that they're tight before use. You're going to want to inspect the strap that holds the, the leg back. You're going to make, want to make sure that all of the locks are in place on the teeth that hold that together and that that ratchet mechanism has not been smashed. You're going to want to make sure that there isn't anything wrong or there's any cracks or extra bows in the legs, uh, anything that could cause that to fail that way. You're also going to want to make sure that you're not setting movement that's going to put you into those legs or any other structures that could potentially injure you. That's really important as a setter and if it's a home wall, you are the head setter for that wall, unless you're going to hire somebody to come in and do it, which if you are, can I come over? I definitely don't have enough money to hire a route setter to come over and route set, but you do want to make sure that those routes are safe. Your crash pad that's down on the ground that's going to keep you from those heavy impacts on the ground or on the floor is in place and properly placed. If it's outside, you could potentially get away with uh, some wood chips, but I think I would also supplement with a crash pad, like just a regular outdoor bouldering crash pad, um, or some really nice gravel, again, supplementing with a nice crash pad. If it's indoors, I would place a large mat over the whole thing. You can, uh, you can get used beds. Ugh, okay, let, let me back up here. If you're buying a used mattress, just make sure that it's clean, okay? I talked all about that in another video where I talked about all about climbing gym flooring and covered that. I hope that you've enjoyed this video. If you have, give me the thumbs up button and that, that you found it informative. This wasn't really for entertainment, but talking all about climbing wall, getting back into that area and Thank you for joining me. Hit the like button, subscribe, share it with your friends, and I'll see you next time right here on Climber Dad.